Hello, everybody. Lyndon, you want to give me a wave if you can hear me? Right on. I muted you. So uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to unmute the panelists today. We're going to all introduce ourselves. And as people trickle in over the next few minutes, uh, we will uh, just kill some time and then we'll get started maybe five, maybe kind of five, five minutes past the hour. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. This uh, worked really well last month. Looking forward to doing it again. And uh, you know, hopefully, we, if we got to do it again next month, we'll do that too. But uh, just really appreciate everybody continuing to invest the time to uh, to participate in this community here. So, you know, I guess uh, I don't see John on yet, or is that John? Yep. Right hey guys, nice to meet you. Yeah, perfect. Nice to meet you too, John. So. John and Dil Raj are from Adastra, and Adastra is going to provide our first presentation tonight. And then after uh, John presents, we're going to hear from Tim, uh, who is doing some really interesting stuff with the Calgary AI Club. So maybe why don't we just do real quick introductions, including Tim, and then we'll just turn it over to Dil Raj to talk about Adastra for a few minutes, and then to you, John. So. Uh, why don't we start with uh, just with me? So if you've only attended uh, the, if you have not attended the in-person events and this is the first time that you're attending virtu virtually, I'm Drew, I work for Google and I'm the organizer of the meetup, so welcome. And uh, why don't we pass it over to uh, Tim. Tim, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, hi everyone, uh, everyone at home. Thanks uh, so much for tuning in. This is super exciting. Uh, my name is Tim. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the Calgary AI Club. Um, and yeah, tonight, uh, just at a high level, I'm going to be uh, talking about some of the ecosystem, uh, ecosystem uh, building work that uh, we're doing over at the club in terms of uh, creating a really healthy ecosystem for AI development in Calgary. Right on. And then uh, Dilraj, if you don't mind, uh, I think you, I see your video on, but you're muted. Uh, and then uh, if you haven't joined the Slack channel, uh, while Dilaraj and John are introducing themselves, please go ahead and do that. There's a link in the Zoom chat that you can click on, or if you can't click on it, copy and paste. That'll get you into the Slack channel, and that's where I prefer to take questions. Uh, it's just going to be easier. Last time we took questions in two places, it'll be better for everyone if we just stick to the Slack channel. Yeah. Dilaraj, welcome. Thank you so much, Drew, for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank you and Lyndon for organizing um, this great webinar. Um, I would say it's our first day of summer. I don't know who else is residing in Calgary that's joined this session right now, but it's a beautiful sunny day. So I really appreciate those keeners who want to learn um, more about artificial intelligence uh, and this subject to, to join us. So a real quick introduction on myself and then I'll pass it over to John Yanni. Uh, I'm the director of Adastra Canada based here in Calgary and we're a consulting organization who's focused on creating job opportunities, especially for the Calgary market. Uh, me being a resident of um, Calgary and Alberta, and we know the impact that the economy is having on our, you know, our unemployment rate right now. So we, we work extremely hard to create opportunities for those that are out there and impacted, whether it's fighting against the, the COVID situation, whether it's um, modernizing the energy sector clients to optimize for cost reductions and then more efficient, increasing efficiencies. Um, so those are some of the, the key highlights that, that Adastra is focusing on and we wanna encourage. Uh, so I'll share my contact information as well with you. I don't wanna to take too much time introducing myself there, but I'll pass the baton over uh, to John Yanni. So John, Dr. John Yanni, I'd like to say, he's a chief analytics officer at Adastra Corporation. And, um, We'll be focusing today on the geospatial, geospatial and analytics techniques in, in mining. So with, without further ado, John, go ahead, please. Thanks, Delaware. Um, so, so as Delaware said, I'm John Yanni, the Chief Analytics Officer at Adastra Canada. Um, and uh, essentially uh, what I'll be covering today is um, statistics, spatial stats uh, for analyzing uh, nutrient distributions. Um, so let me just start sharing my screen. And John, just right before you get going, I just want to say uh, thank you to Lyndon. So Lyndon uh, is extremely helpful pulling these things together, and I appreciate him very much. So he's just the last panelist. So Lyndon, uh, you know, couldn't do without you, big guy. Give everybody a wave, and then we'll listen to John. Thanks. Okay, over to you, John. Perfect. 
Okay, please let me know if you can see. Yeah, looks good. Okay, perfect. Um, so, so today I'm going to talk about spatial statistics for analyzing nutrient distributions. Um, so at a high level, uh, I'll, I'll give a very tops of the waist summary since Dilraj already covered it uh, about who Adastra is um, and I'll introduce myself in a little bit more detail. Um, then I'll cover some introductions and definitions. Um, so covering basically all the fundamental principles required for, for this study. Um, then I'll talk about the data set composition. So I am sure all of you can appreciate the amount of uh, effort involved uh, in comprising and collecting data and consolidating data into an analytical data set. So um, I'll get into that in a little bit more rigorous detail um, as it pertains to spatial analysis, uh, summarize with some results, and then wrap up with the conclusions. Um, so as Dilwar said, I'm uh, Dr. Giannani, Chief Analytics Officer at Adastra Canada, um, where my responsibilities has been principally leading the data science practice. Um, as part of my sort of umbrella uh, under the Chief Analytics Office, there is uh, a data engineering group, um, as well as a visualization practice that also sort of um, acts uh, in, in collaboration with, but uh, is somewhat separate from the data science practice. Um, my development so, you know, kind of spans back um, since my early undergrad days, so about 15 years now, um, starting with some Java development, um, more recently in R and Python, um, and then sequence, uh, SQL and Spark as well. Um, so, so I think, um, you know, I would say throughout my, throughout my sort of academic career, um, started with mathematics, uh, principally applied mathematics, uh, migrated into a master's in statistics, um, focused on um, basically computer, computer science techniques that applied to uh, st statistical problems. Um, so I uh, re-engineered some, some of the workloads that I were, was executing in R in uh, C. Um, and then throughout my PhD, I basically took that, that love for computer science and mathematics into uh, my PhD, which I uh, focused on scientific computing. Um, so, so, you know, very, very uh, happy to know that data science is essentially the culmination of the two. And so fortunate enough that, um, you know, I, I ended up in this field. Um, so, so very tops of the waves introduction of Adastra Group. Um, so we're 2,000 plus professionals um, spanning 500 plus projects. Um, our annual revenue is, is strong and uh, has been growing ever since uh, the Adastra Group first formed in 2000. Um, and 75% of our clients are repeat cl clients. So we do see, uh, you know, the frequent, uh, frequent um, reintroduction of, of clients and, and projects from, from our, our past work. Um, in Adastra Group itself, so so we're you know essentially the uh, Adastra consulting arm of the Adastra Group, but there's a set of other um, organizations that basically roll up into the Adastra Group, um, and essentially what we deal with is anything uh, within the data and AI space, from from architecture straight down to us uh, basically um, servicing the data to to our end clients. Um, and this is a, more or less a, a high level overview of the solution offerings from our uh, Adastra Corporation. Um, and then just as it pertains to data science, so there's a few different um, application areas. So, um, you know, the different solutions that we worked on with clients have been uh, within the forecasting space, um, different types of simulations and optimization problems, uh, financial impact analysis, so looking at things like uh, dynamic and real-time dashboards for calculating profitability metrics based on a set of scenarios. Um, anomaly detection, whether that be through outlier detection or we've uh, implemented some uh, complex LSTM type models as well. Um, and then there's other uh, types of applications as well within sentiment analysis, uh, risk, profitability analysis, and geospatial analysis. Um, so, so I don't want to bore you with the details of the company, so, so let's get into the meat of the presentation. Um, so the problem that I was uh, basically tasked with for this project was to analyze uh, an area of uh, South Central Ontario. Um, if anybody's familiar with sort of the Muskoka regions, um, this, uh, this watershed is, is called the 2EB watershed, um, and it encompasses uh, 611 odd lakes. Um, that, that basically, uh, there was a, a huge uh, amount of background information, so, so, so basically nutrient survey information. Um, there's a, a huge amount of information about the spiny water flea, which um, is part of the, the, the type of uh, zooplankton that we're analyzing uh, within this study. Um, and and uh, essentially with all that information, we're able to gather um, a lot of sort of um, associated data uh, on, these, on these watersheds. 
Um, and so the principal sort of problem of, of in question was to analyze uh, the distribution of calcium within these water bodies. Um, so, so primarily, you know, calcium concentrations are, are very important for sort of the bottom of the food chain, chain zooplankton. Um, so, so if uh, if the if the calcium concentration goes below critical thresholds of uh, 1.5 milligrams, it's shown to have uh, really detrimental impacts on the on the growth of population of zooplankton within within these water bodies, um, and, and because they're at the bottom of the aquatic food chain, um, that does end up causing um, you know issues with sort of growth in fish and other other sort of um, other sort of uh, you know steps within the food chain, right? So, so essentially, um, analyzing and indicating where uh, low calcium concentrations are. Uh, to exist are, are, is critical, a critical need, both from uh, being able to disseminate problem areas, but then also being able to indicate where, uh, where we need to uh, sample to, to validate our findings. Um, so in terms of technical uh, considerations, um, so this really focuses on calcium across a 2D spatial region, um, but the techniques that we'll be imploring, uh, which are Krieging analysis, is typically based on a Euclidean distance-based metric. Um, so the problem with, um, applying Krieging within the context of water bodies um, is that Euclidean sort of birds fly distance isn't as applicable as something like uh, underlying stream network distance. Um, so we're going to see a few set of results, both based on the Euclidean measure, um, allocating some covariance uh, metrics as well uh, to basically try to stabilize some of the variances. Um, and then we're going to see um, that actually implementing a stream distance based approach can actually reduce both the variance and um, increase the accuracy of the prediction. Um, so, so geospatial uh, analysis techniques at a high level um, really encompass um, different types of applications. So, so it could be some, as simple as visualizing GIS map information, um, overlaying particular metrics such as morphological and remote sensor readings, uh, partition, partitioning or um, uh, basically segmenting um, your, your uh, geospatial space, right? So if we're looking at sort of land use uh, metrics, uh, partitioning or overlaying aggregate measures, so things like uh, what you'll see later which is a calcium decline map, um, incorporating other um, spatial stats methods for deeper insights. So this is um, as we're looking at sort of uh, incorporating external features um, and, and being able to disseminate what it is that drives underlying calcium decline. Um, we'll be able to look at some of the relationships between uh, external covariant metrics and the uh, principal, um, pr principal parameter under study, which is calcium. Um, so, so in terms of um, consolidating and, and looking at geospatial analysis, um, you know, so, some of you may be familiar with um, GeoJSON type formats. So um, obviously there's complexity in terms of just uh, gathering and, and being able to, to uh, show this data in, in near real time. Um, and then looking at, um, looking at other types of measures um, such as geostatistical techniques, we can build some more robust sort of uh, analytical, uh, analytical models that are able to build probabilistic maps for us. So, so I'll get into those techniques again as well later in the presentation. Um, so at a high level, one, one of the simplistic uh, methods that we do implement are, are things like k-nearest neighbors. Um, so this, uh, you know, for, for people in the AI space, they'll be familiar with these types of techniques. Um, so, so basically, uh, in the context of uh, k-nearest neighbors, uh, you could take a sample and, and look at sort of the, the nearest samples within a 2D spatial, uh, a spatial region and, and gather, you know, whether it be like a mean value from those k-nearest neighbors, or um, if it's an indicator, you could assign the indicator um, you know, the, the, the most frequently occurring class, for example. Um, there's other opportunities to apply things like k-means clustering models. Um, so for example, especially if you have um, some samples. Um, so in our case, uh, we ended up gridding the space into uh, approximately 1,200 uh, sample points, but we had um, initially 311 and then later 500 and some um, sample points for, for different lake, uh, different water bodies within that space. Um, so we can use sort of a clustering technique and then uh, allocate um, allocate uh, individual new samples to each cluster and, and use an associated aggregate average based on the cluster that the, the sample resides in. Um, we'll see, you know, some of the shortcomings of those techniques. Um, other opportunities like linear or poly polynomial spline interpolations are based on sort of uh, numerical approaches that, um, you know, we could potentially look at applying for, for uh, interpolation as well. Um, so, so in terms of, you know, why why some of those uh, previous techniques um, don't work particularly well in the context of uh, of sort of the applications that we're going to see is that um, there's what's 
what's this so-called nugget effect? Um, so as we apply a Krieging analysis, uh, we're, we'll get into sort of the underlying principles of Krieging in a little bit more, uh, a little bit more depth. But basically, the idea of a nugget effect is that um, you could have multiple samples that kind of um, uh, uh, multiple samples that may be very closely, uh, very close uh, inter terms of spatial distance um, and the readings might be low. So for example, in this, you know, by, by very, or, or by Gaussian plot here, um, but, uh, but you, you might just be basically hitting points that are low uh, around a peak. Um, and so the, the nugget effect really uh, basically encompasses some of those, uh, some of the expected variability that you get in individual reading. Um, and it's able to basically uh, model these, uh, you know, supposed uh, nuggets, right? Um, and, and that's essentially where the, the kind of the idea of Krieging came from to begin with. Um, so Krieging itself was uh, initially introduced by Daniel Gerhardus Krieg um, in 1963, coupled with George Matheron, who uh, applied it to the gold deposits in the Witwatersrand. Um, so this is essentially a, a gold mine um, where they were looking for um, the most probabilistic areas of high gold concentration. Um, and so again, sort of looking at that bivariate Gaussian plot that we saw in the previous image, or a previous slide, we can see that you know when, when it when it pertain, pertains to mineral samples, uh, you may have a number of sort of low reading or low value samples um, circling around a very high value sample, and so um, Krieging really is um, sort of constructed to solve this type of problem. Um, and so if you apply Krieging to just a general spatial context in one variable, it's, uh, it gives you the technique called ordinary Krieging. That's sort of the baseline technique. Um, it, it just, uh, there, there is an approach called simple Krieging, but usually people like in ordinary Krieging to the quote unquote Krieging um, techniques. Um, this basically uses Euclidean distance measure. Um, and, and if you apply the same approach to an indicator function, whether you apply that to like an under over um, sort of you know, a, a, a basically one hot encoding of a feature, um, it'll give you what's called indicator Krieging, which generates a probability map. Um, so in terms of some of the geospatial um, basic concepts, so um, in, a, in, in sort of, uh, you know, multi-dimensional space, we can have essentially a position or a spatial position denoted as this uh, bold-faced xi value um, belongs to some area within a domain. Um, the true measure of a particular um, reading, which in our case is, is calcium concentration, could be measured as, you know, little u of xi. Um, basic, uh, basically, basically uh, a realization of an underlying stochastic process, a uh, uh, stationary goes in process ux. Um, so, so the stationary assumption implies that essentially the covariance between ux and ux plus h is solely based on the distance between those two points. Um, and so this is really the foundational cornerstone of Krieging in that um, the covariance, and, and we're going to see later, the, the variogram is related to essentially the, the spatial separation. Um, or, or, you know, kind of put more sort of uh, trivially is that the variability of your data sort of uh, goes up as, um, or variability of readings goes up. Um, as a function of distance. Um, so, so there's a set of sort of underlying principles here. Um, starting from the covariance, um, we, we go down to essentially the, vary, uh, the variance at a particular point, uh, which is, is essentially modeled by that nugget effect, which we'll, we'll see on a, a couple slides following. Um, so the cor correlogram is sort of like the correlation coefficient. Um, you know, it, it's basically normalized by the variance, the, the covariance normalized with the variance, and, and we end up with this um, uh, so, sort of fundamental function. Um, there's a couple important properties in that, you know, when, when we look at sort of the, the correlation coefficient of zero, it's, it's one, so basically all values are correlated with themselves. Um, you know, pretty trivial. Um, and, and as each increases, essentially the relationship between the two data points um, tends to zero or tends to no relationship. So that if you take two samples on opposite sides of the world, um, you'd expect the relationship to be, um, you know, trivial at best. Um, so, so uh, you know, the, the other related co concept that I talked about in, in the context of geostatistical analysis is what's, the, what's called this variogram. Um, so the variogram is essentially a squared difference between uh, uh, between the readings um, uh, separated by a distance h, and uh, we'll see that you know this is obviously a theoretical concept in terms of continuous space, but uh, we'll see it in a, in a more uh, empirical setting soon. 
Um, so, so under you know stationarity, um, the the variogram essentially reduces uh, to to this uh, this concept here. Um, you know, the, this is sort of simplifies to uh, to this underlying uh, underlying um, function as we see on the on the last line. And so, this is um, a, again one of the the, the basic principles uh, of of Krieging analysis is this uh, is this correlogram, uh, or, or sorry, variogram, but in in the context of uh, discrete space, we'll, we'll, we're going to talk about what's called a, a, a uh, semi variance. Um, so, so in the empirical, uh, in the empirical sort of uh, discrete space, um, we basically have to take all these continuous measures and, and uh, you know rewrite everything from integrals to sums, um, and so we get sort of these empirical like for like definitions of of some of these terms, right? And so, so in the ca case of the covariance function, uh, we see this uh, this uh, this measure here um, normalized by the variance of of the the samples of y y and y prime. Uh, we end up with the correlation coefficient. Efficient. Um, the empirical value for the variogram again is very similar to essentially um, a, a weighted a average of the squared de de uh, deviances between points separated by a, a separation of h um, and, and so we'll, we'll see shortly what that looks like um, in, in the actual uh, Krieging scenario. Um, and then, if we add some some noise essentially to this data, because uh, because we, we can look at sort of um, samples uh, as zi uh, samples from an underlying distribution of zxi, um, this can or you can kind of assign this essentially the true value plus some variance from that true value. So essentially, it's an approximation for uxi, but we add this error term uh, denoted by the epsilon i. Um, then we get some approximations for the covariance functions um, based based on these principles, and so uh, really all, all it all it boils down to is essentially the original um, covariance function in the, in the true space, uh, coupled with some some variations um, as well at uh, when when you look at a separation distance of zero. Um, and so th this is uh, this is a slide that I've been referencing a couple times, um, which is the properties of the variogram. Um, so so basically what you do is you will calculate um, the squared variance between, or the squared difference uh, between uh, individual points, uh, and you'll plot it as sort of this cloud, um, where h is essentially the separation distance between points, and then you have the squared variance between those points. Um, and, and then what you do is you, you bin that cloud into into essentially, um, you know, a, a histogram, if you will. Uh, uh, and usually that's a 25, uh, 25 bins, which is a typical rule of thumb. Um, and then from there, you'll apply usually a nonlinear curve fitting technique to um, to get to get what's uh, what's essentially um, your underlying variogram in the context of Krieging. Um, so, so there's four key concepts of note in uh, in this um, sort of sample variogram. Um, so the nugget, which is basically uh, equal to the variance and the chance fluctuations. So this is um, you know that the, those variations that I, that I talked about, basically to to highlight and model some of those real chance uh, fluctuations that could occur. For example, if you uh, sort of you know, uh, end up sampling around the peak in your bivariate Gaussian distribution, which I which I like to think about. Um, the, the sill is basically as as h goes to infinity, it's the expected variance. Um, you know, uh, as uh, as you tend off to infinity, so so basically it's the the limit or the most varying um, your your samples are expected to be within your within your space. And again, because you're sampling from within uh, an area that is constrained, you expect there's some relationship between uh, certain sample points, but but you'll kind of limit. To, to what extent um, those variations uh, will, will tend off to. Um, the practice effective range is basically where the correlation coefficient tends down to 0 0.05. So it's you know short, usually typically right before we we uh, get to the sill, um, and then the max distance is is actually literally just the the largest value of h between your sample points. So so it's a pretty trivial uh, pretty trivial um, uh, value if you will. Um, so, so there's a few different curve fitting procedures. Um, so, so usually there's underlying functions. Um, so the variograms take on sort of a, a family of different potential uh, options, um, and you'll apply usually OLS, WS, uh, maximum likelihood, or uh, re restricted maximum likelihood, um, comparing RMSE to, to basically determine what the optimal parameters are for for those curves. Um, so, so there's some variations to Krieging. So, um, in terms of Krieging, uh, you know, typically because there's so much dependence on the Gaussian, uh, the underlying Gaussian distribution of the data. If, if on the other hand, your data is not Gaussian or dis er, er, normally distributed, um, that then you can apply a log transformation to your data before applying Krieging. Um, and, and essentially, 
you know, with the, without going into the, some of the nitty gritty details, uh, you can back transform this into the original data uh, via this transformation. Um, however, the only limitation to this is that um, you cannot actually uh, solve for the unbiased back transformation, the Krieging variance, um, which is actually quite a pivotal part of uh, the, the analysis typically. Um, and then you can also apply what's called Krieging with external drift, which is essentially what I like to think about as co-Krieging or um, Krieging with covariates. Um, so basically what you'll do is you'll model um, your sample point as a linear combination of, uh, of other variables. So just like a multivariate linear regression model. Um, and then there's a, a, a way to basically construct all the, all the uh, essential underlying, um, underlying um, underlying uh, linear, linear um, equations essentially based on, on that uh, assumption. Um, so, so here's sort of the, the defi definition um, uh, of the underlying uh, Krieging equations uh, under that sort of uh, multivariate space. Um, and then uh, essentially you end up with this uh, system of equations which you basically solve for those weights in uh, the, sample, uh, the sample means as well. So I appreciate you sticking with me through all the math. So I'll get into some of the more, uh, you know, sort of, sort of the mon fun concepts, I guess, in terms of actual, uh, you know, people that, that, that do dig around in data all day um, may, may appreciate. Um, so, so when I was constructing the data set, the first piece of, uh, the, or the first source of data that I received was, you know, um, God help me, an access database. Um, and, and this access database, uh, the two principal tables were, were lake and water chemistry. Um, so the water chemistry had things like pH, true color, alkalinity, conductivity, and had a set of micronutrients as well. So calcium and phosphorus and whatnot. Um, and then the lake information basically had UTM coordinates, uh, positions uh, for, for those lakes, as well as some information around the size of the lakes, the depths of the lakes. Um, in order to standardize, um, a lot of the other data sources had to be converted to UTM coordinates. Um, th there was also different time scales. Um, so some of the samples were taken at different, uh, different times within the year, um, so sometimes multiple times a year. Um, so some, some uh, means and, and, and aggregates had to be calculated based on on those different points in time um, and, and then reference to to uh, to the other data sources that we received um, so in particular we received some information from the district of Muskoka uh, a governmental body on on what they called the a B and DMM uh, lakes um, and so the the final consolidated data set um, once we went through sort of all the transformations uh, was 578 lakes um, and then we wanted to intersect this with some information such as uh, forestry information. Um, so the idea here was that, you know, based on some of the, the clear cutting and other types of uh, forestry initiatives, um, could some of the detritus basically be causing runoff uh, to occur, adding micronutrients to the water. Um, so, so we basically gathered the, this forestry data set um, from, from West Wind Forestries that had all the information on, on clear cutting within the, within the area of interest during that particular time. Um, and then using ArcGIS, um, I, I created basically uh, um, a three kilometer uh, radius um, uh, or disks of so three kilometer radius around each of the lakes and then intersected those with uh, expected forestation within those regions. And so I, I got um, some aggregate measures both uh, as a whole um, and then looking at individual um, individual um, different types of, uh, of cuts essentially. So, so I had some aggregate metrics based on, you know, the amount of clear cutting that was performed or the amount of, uh, you know, trimming and whatnot that, that had occurred. Um, so, so further information on the underlying soil structure uh, was gathered. So initially we started with this Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food, which had um, actually quite a bit of information, but then once we intersected it, you know, uh, painstakingly uh, unfortunately realized that it did not intersect our region very well. Um, so this is the image to the right. Um, but we did gather some further information from the Ministry of Northern uh, Development and Mines um, passed on by the Ontario Geologic Survey, which, which had a lot of information on the underlying um, sort of bedrock structures. Um, so predominant soil type, primary uh, epochs of the deposits, the veneer, the permeability. So, so a lot of information on the underlying structure of the soil. Um, you know, it doesn't have as much information on the surface, uh, the surface, uh, like, uh, you know, basically information on plants or other structures but that, that do occur. But, uh, but in terms of, um, you know, being able to sort of intersect this with our study region, there may be some uh, you know, uh, variables that were of interest uh, based on the soil data. 
Um, and then another very interesting uh, data set was actually uh, the road, rail, and stream networks. Um, so, so first we started with sort of road, uh, road networks and rail networks. Um, and the thought here was that, um, especially during uh, you know winter periods uh, when when we have sort of calcium, uh, calcium carbonate um, road salts being used, um, there may be additional runoff that does introduce things, especially calcium uh, to to water bodies. Um, so, so we applied a similar approach uh, to to the forestation. Um, you know, given just the the amount of roads and the amount of uh, railways within the region, uh, we we ended up uh, creating the disks a little bit smaller. So we used um, basically radiuses of 500 and 1,000 meters, and then intersected those with the road network. Um, and this gave some some pretty good fluctuations in terms of the the underlying sort of associations between the roads and the different water samples. Um, and then the stream network. So, so we had both information that was um, supplied here, but then we also um, had some university contacts that we uh, gathered some information from as well, uh, which did give very detailed information on both the underlying stream network um, as well as some flow metrics, which um, uh, I'll get into a little bit later. Um, so, so the first uh, the first set of results actually just deals with with just the the raw calcium uh, distribution, um, and so it looks at just the the single univariate uh, distribution uh, on a two D spatial region. Um, and so this th these RMSC calculations are based on uh, a leave one out cross validation approach. Um, and so so if we look at uh, across all of our samples using the leave one out cro cross validation approach, um, we can see that basically our, our RMSC is on the order of two point five. Uh, milligrams per liter, which uh, which we're going to see is actually quite large, um, and so we wanted to obviously reduce that a little bit further uh, based on a, a few different, um, whether it be covariate factors, so, so creating with external drift or based on the stream underlying stream uh, patterns. So, so we'll, we'll see some improvements to that. Um, but just in in a sense, you know, like what does 2.5 mean, um, you know, in the, in the relative scheme of things? Um, so so when we're dealing with calcium measures that range from 0 to 11, um, with a mean value around 2.8. Um, it's obviously quite a large error, right? So, so we want to obviously uh, improve on that quite a bit. Um, but just as a, as a sense, um, this is the underlying distribution plot. Um, so, so based on the WLS predictions, which uh, gave the best RMSE, um, this was essentially uh, what the distribution of calcium looked like across that watershed. Um, so, so, you know, taking this a step further and applying um, the fundamental principles we talked about, um, to, to um, look at a particular threshold of interest, um, we basically uh, created a, a delta function that looked at calcium concentrations uh, above or below uh, 2.5 uh, milligrams per liter. Um, so if it was below 2.5 milligrams per liter, we coded with a one, if it was above, we coded with zero. Um, and then, so what this creaking could do was basically gave us a probability map of uh, what the probability was that the uh, calcium readings within the particular uh, regions of interest would be below um, the 2.5 milligram, which is, is uh, it, it's a critical threshold, but the actual um, critical, uh, the, the biggest or the most critical threshold is 1.5 milligrams per liter. Um, but we, we have seen as well that zooplankton uh, between 1.5 and 2.5 milligrams uh, per liter of calcium within the, the water bodies have also shown a 60% reduction in, uh, in their population as well. So, um, so this is still, um, you know, even though there's the uh, underlying physiology that does, um, uh, that does attribute 1.5 milligrams per liter as um, as that critical threshold, um, there's been evidence as well that 2.5 um, is a critical uh, is a critical threshold as well. Um, so, so this initially just gave us the prediction, uh, a predicted probability map with some of the associated variances, and as we see here as well, so the variances are very large uh, <clears throat> when we look at just the um, just the univariate calcium distribution. Um, so then the next thing we want to do is actually. Um, look at, uh, at basically intersecting different types of um, covariate uh, covariates uh, with the calcium. Um, so, so the first uh, the first of which we used was actually the catchment areas. Um, so, so the underlying water bodies are are segmented into different catchment regions. Um, so we would expect that uh, <coughs> sorry. So we'd expect that um, water bodies that share the same catchment areas would have similar sort of um, patterns. Um, and so we did see a relationship here. Um, uh, unfortunately, if you look at sort of no trend versus catchment, the RMSC is, is very similar. Um, 
however, there, there are some uh, quite stark reductions in, in the variances. Um, so, so if we look at sort of the original uh, variance distribution uh, versus, the, versus the variance with the, uh, with, with, um, with the covariates, then, then we'll see a reduction. Um, so, so this is another uh, very interesting variable of study, which was the nearness to railroads. Um, so in particular, uh, again, based on de-icing, uh, it, it was seen that there was actually a, a strong relationship between uh, the intersected regions of railroads with, uh, uh, with those um, so, sort of uh, catchment areas around each of the lakes. Um, and, and we saw that the, the mean variance in this case was actually stabilized to 1.4 as well, instead of the underlying uh, roughly 2.5%, or 2.5, I believe it was. Um, and, and then really the most powerful technique um, that was implemented was uh, the Krieging with stream distance. Um, so, so not only do we see that, uh, you know, even just from just the trivial sort of observation of the semivariance, we see that it follows very closely sort of the typical distribution, which is this uh, uh, sort, of, sort of hyperbolic tangent sort of appearance. Um, but, but then if we look at actually the underlying uh, calcium predictions um, and, and more so the actual variances, um, we see that uh, the predictions have stabilized very significantly. Um, so, so, you know, even though there are some, you know, still, still some uh, errors within the model, um, the, the variances are, are significantly reduced, which is uh, actually very beneficial for determining regions as to where we want to actually send out survey teams uh, the following year. Um, and, and so circling back to the indicator Krieging, um, we could use, um, you know, whether it be indicator Krieging approaches or in, in the context of uh, looking at particular thresholding of our, of our, um, of our results um, based on the previous slide, uh, we can look at, you know, where the, the critical sort of levels of uh, calcium exist. And so we see that there's, there's a small set of water, uh, water bodies uh, on the left image that, that show a very, uh, very uh, significant reduction in calcium. Um, and then if we actually look at uh, the means, uh, the mean predicted values and the variances and, and just apply just a normal distribution to look at, um, you know, the outliers. So, so, so in what case um, is there an actual, uh, you know, probability or, or um, essentially a, a, a significant probability that the, their samples could be below 1.5 milligrams per liter, uh, we get the image on the right. Um, and so we, we see that, you know, Principally, there's a, a huge reduction in calcium to the to the northeast, but but there are uh, sort of a smorgasbord or a, a smattering of samples that also show uh, a, a a fairly decent probability of uh, of there being uh, calcium concentrations below 1.5 milligrams per liter. Um, and so I didn't want to I didn't want to introduce a whole another sort of section within this presentation, but one thing that we did do is we we looked at um, sort of this uh, this um, basically this uh, th this Poisson sort of distribution approach with uh, sort of marginal samples. Um, and, and, and this underlying approach basically uh, looks at, you know, sort of w what's the marginal uh, population of zooplankton and based on the, the sampling that we do, uh, that we did observe uh, and based on the calcium declines within different regions, um, you know, is this or is this not a significant relationship with the actual zooplankton population? Um, and so we do see that uh, within the specific areas that we had samples, um, that there were a number of uh, regions, principally the, the areas of low calcium, where there was a significant relationship between the zoo, the distribution of the zooplankton population and uh, the calcium concentrations observed within that region. Um, so, so just a, a few more slides in terms of conclusions. Um, so, so throughout this work, uh, you know, leveraged um, uh, leveraged a, a set of different techniques. Um, so starting with sort of the trivial uh, ordinary Krieging approach, uh, then the, the Krieging with external trends, uh, and then le leveraged uh, the stream, uh, the Krieging with stream distance based on the underlying stream measures. Uh, the, the, the benefit of this work was that actually in subsequent years, the Ministry of the Environment, who is our, our, principal, uh, our principal client for this work, um, use these assessments uh, to basically send out surveying teams. And, and the benefit, because this was uh, actually done a, a few years back, um, it was that we were able to get feedback that, you know, that these were actually extremely beneficial for them to, to get accurate uh, accurate um, uh, sample regions for, for their teams to, to uh, basically take uh, subsequent samples. Um, and, and beyond that, um, you know, so, so, so some kind of high level takeaways. Uh, so geospatial analysis, obviously rich and rewarding. Um, you know, if, if you're like me and, and kind of a math nerd, then I would say, um, you know, obviously it has its whole uh, set of sort of niche uh, interesting, uh, you know, mathematical principles that, that we 
uh, that, that you can explore. Um, you know, static methods, um, you know, with, with some interesting tweaks can be applied to new and unique areas with surprising levels of accuracy. So in particular, um, the, the creaking uh, models that, that, you know, typically were, um, you know, sample or typically leveraged within a sort of a static domain, like a mining, uh, a mining, um, or with the mines, um, it could be basically a tweak to be applied to underlying water bodies. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the creaking models themselves can be explored in many different contexts, right? So we can talk about, you know, looking at any two-dimensional geospatial type of a map. So if we're looking at things like distribution of snowfall and snowfall levels or, um, you know, accurate at, at elevation and thermography readings or, um, you know, being able to distinguish high concentrations of, of um, mining uh, minerals so, so, or, or potentially, um, you know, principal regions of, of high high amounts of oil uh, for, for drilling purposes, um, or, or even uh, other things like indicator probabilities such as crime rates or whatnot within a geospatial, uh, any, anything where we have uh, samples within a geospatial domain, uh, we, we can basically apply these, uh, these techniques to. Uh, and thank you everybody for your time. Um, so here's my contact details. Uh, you know, please feel free to, um, obviously if you have further questions beyond the ones that uh, I think people have been putting in the chat, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thanks, John. So we did see a few uh, questions from Stephen Clark. No problem. If, if uh, Stephen has a mic, I, uh, would be happy to give him the opportunity to ask these questions live. So um, I'm just going to give him the opportunity to to, uh, to speak. And if he doesn't, then we can just read the questions from the chat. Stephen, are you able to, to use a mic? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Nice. Uh, yeah, so I do a lot of geospatial analytics uh, with machine learning backends. Perfect. So we just looking at Kriging and I've done analysis with Kriging and I was wondering if you'd use some of the more uh, some of the more interesting new tools from Ezri with the spatially constrained multivariate clustering as a comparison to Kriging uh, and uh, also with uh, principal component analysis. Uh, yeah, so unfortunately for this study I did not um, and uh, Actually, I haven't haven't went back to, to take a look at applying those types of approaches to to this particular problem now. Uh, well, I've done some recently stuff, and it's interesting how um, Kriging has some areas, but I find when you look at all the different uh, geospatial or geostatistical analysis, sometimes you can get more insight with some of the newer tools that Esri has popped out. Right. Yeah. Okay. No. Like. Um, and, and that's true. I. I mean. I haven't. Um, I haven't looked at sort of the more recent techniques that have been leveraged by by Esri. So this is obviously using a more sort of conventional approach. Um, I, I. I guess. Um, you know. I, not. Not to sort of open up debate, but but maybe maybe it's it's worth uh, having the conversation. Is is just around the scalability of those of those models. Um, I don't know if you've sort of explored. Um, you know, how, how the performance is in terms of at scale uh, calculations, because I, I guess that was one of the limitations that initially I faced in, in throughout this research uh, was that even some of the tools uh, in, in just applying creaking within those tools, um, there was a, a number of constraints in terms of computational efficiency. So, uh, so part of the work that I, that I didn't end up uh, highlighting was just being able to recode this into, uh, into C with, uh, with uh, some distributed backends, uh, was basically able to scale this up quite, quite large in terms of the calculations, especially when we went into the sort of the zooplankton parameterization and simulations. Um, but but I, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to look at sort of how those models scale um, or how those techniques scale. Um. Uh, yes, I actually did quite a bit of work and I'll give you an example of how Perfect. we dealt with it. Um, FME is used are one of our big tools we use out of Vancouver. Uh, we wrap the Esri Python back in inside FME okay. and it can deal with uh, hundreds of thousands of records per minute. Perfect. Um, okay. So, nice. so all of the work you were doing with the Esri, I would just suggest you look at the FME. Um, yeah, perfect. it has a lot of stuff in there. It's, uh, I've been using it for a long time. So, uh, and I did one recently with about uh, seventy thousand records um, being crunched across the system in about a minute and a half on just a basic perfect. standard uh, GIS engine, from Esri. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, no, I mean I'll have to take a look at that particular technique. I mean I've used you know, principal components in the context of other um, sort of studies, but but not within uh, not within this uh, this study. Yeah. Did you also do a temporal analysis? Um, 
looking at uh, like over time saying, you know, as uh, the you know, by season as an example? Yeah, so unfortunately we didn't have that level of detail in the samples, but that was actually something that we, we talked about very early on. Um, the, the unfortunate thing was that the readings that we had, because um, because the surveys actually, they're, they're very expensive to, to do and, and they have to send out, you know, individual teams uh, out to survey these regions that they only had. Um, at best, they did have monthly readings for, for about a year, um, but, but to get some true seasonality impacts, um, uh, that was something that we would have been interested in looking at, but unfortunately didn't have the, the data to support. Uh, and the last question I guess I would have was, was there any type of uh, satellite imagery or remote sensing data that you could have acquired as well that could look at that area, um, you know, to be able to get some of the uh, conditions for calcium, et cetera, like that from just, you know, satellite imagery or some of the remote sensing uh, sensors? Um, so I didn't look at satellite imagery within that region. Um, I mean, we were looking at more at just the, the structure data analysis, um, but, but we have used um, GIS images for other types of land use segmentation type models. Um, but, but in this context, um, uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't end up applying GIS images for this, uh, for this analysis, no. Thanks, Drew, for all the questions for me. All right, thanks. Oh, okay, yeah, no, thank you for the questions, Stephen. If there are no other questions, uh, thanks, John, very much. Uh, no I think we Appreciate will, uh, yeah, but, yeah, no problem. We'll now uh, move to Tim. And if you did have a question for Stephen, I'll make sure. Um, sorry, you did have a question for John. Uh, I'll make sure to get that over to John. And again, his contact, contact info is on the screen. So probably go ahead and email him too. So thanks again, John. Perfect. No problem at all. Okay, Tim. Hello. Can everyone see and hear me? 